Good evening to you all this Saturday, the day between Good Friday and Easter, the day of resurrection. You know, as we consider the first Saturday between Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection, we have to say that the Gospels don't really give us much information uh, concerning the activities of the disciples, that is. And it is the Sabbath, of course, but we can presume that, that based upon their actions of the following evening on Sunday, as they fearfully hide together behind locked doors, that Saturday was spent in secretive fear and dread. The disciples are reeling from the shock of the previous day's events. They had devoted their lives to following this person who had been brutally and shamefully executed as a criminal. And so their hopes for the establishment of God's messianic kingdom lie shattered like so many pieces of broken pottery. They are likely sleep deprived and terrified of pursuit and prosecution by the Jewish leaders. And with their leader executed for encouraging political sedition, they do have good reason, humanly speaking, to be afraid. With Jerusalem still overrun with thousands of Passover pilgrims, it would have been relatively easy to blend in and disappear. Some may have fled to Bethany or elsewhere before sundown Friday. So Luke's statement, on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment, may actually veil the emotional and physical turmoil of Jesus' followers on the day following the crucifixion. It's really only Matthew who records the activities of Saturday. He says near the end of Matthew chapter 27 that the next day, the one after preparation day, that is the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, We remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Well, the fact that the Jewish leaders send this delegation to Pilate on the Sabbath reveals their perception of the situation. They are afraid as well. Their fear may have been exacerbated by the unusual circumstances surrounding Jesus' death, the darkness, the tearing of the curtain, and the earthquake. Would Jesus' death take care of the problem, or would it make it worse? Jesus had made several predictions of his resurrection, which his disciples either failed to understand or had difficulty believing. The Jewish leaders have heard rumors of these predictions, or may even have heard them from Jesus himself, and want to ensure that Jesus' disciples do not perpetrate a hoax by making it appear that the predictions have come true. They, along with the disciples themselves, apparently had no expectation of a genuine supernatural resurrection. I'd like to add to this, those were comments from our authors, but uh, to add to this from Robert Mounts' commentary on the book of Matthew. He writes that some have wondered why the disciples forgot the promise of resurrection while the Jewish leaders remembered it. But for the disciples, it was a time of overwhelming grief and despair in which the promise of resurrection seemed too unreal to grasp. For the religious leaders of Israel, there was the haunting possibility that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, And if so, the totally unexpected could well take place. And as we think of Pilate and his response, Pilate's response is hard to interpret. He could be granting the Jewish authorities permission and providing them with a guard of Roman soldiers from the Roman military guard assigned to temple security. Or he could be denying their request and telling them to guard the tomb with their own Jewish temple police. Either way, he acquiesces to their desire to secure the tomb, and they respond by sealing the stone and setting a guard, perhaps made up of both Roman and Jewish security forces. So that's it for Saturday. That takes us to the end of this day as we await uh, the day of resurrection, the glorious day of resurrection. And before we get there, it's good to continue to contemplate Christ's sufferings. And so I'd like us to leave with the words of the hymn, O Sacred Head, now wounded. Uh, this is a hymn which contemplates the suffering of Christ on the cross, and it, it, was, uh, it originates from a long medieval Latin poem 
written many years ago, which was uh, consisted of seven stanzas. And the stanzas of this poem address the various body parts of Christ that were hanging on the cross. And so there was a stanza about the feet, there's one about the knees, one about the hands. There was a stanza about the pierced side, the breast, the heart, and then finally the last one, the face or the head. And it's on this um, on this part of the body of Christ, on his head, that uh, the hymn, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded, uh, was written. And so have a listen to this hymn as it's sung beautifully by Fernando Ortega. Sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thy only crown how for 